Everyone, I think we're going to start, and I'm hoping that everyone online can hear us. As always, we're never 100% sure whether our technology is working, um, and partic particularly the sound. So if there is a problem, will the online um, attendance please let us know in the chat? But we're going to go ahead and assume that you can, you can hear us. So it's just gone 1 o'clock, and we're going to start the seminar um, First with an introduction and a huge, and to say that we're hugely happy today to be able to host Professor Tula Simpson, um, who's going to be giving um, a paper today on a topic that speaks to uh, his research uh, that has been going on for many, many years. Wow. Professor Tula Simpson is um, a professor and associate professor at the University of Pretoria's History Department. Um, his research is primarily in the past focused on uh, the liberation struggle um, and in particular the MK and the role of the MK in the struggle. Um, he is the author of the very well-known book that many of us have read, uh, Mkonte Wesiswe, uh, The ANC's Armed Struggle, and very recently is uh, the winner of an NIHSS prize for the best uh, nonfiction uh, for his even newer book, um, called The History of South Africa, 1902 to the Present, which some of you, um, particularly if you're in any of our undergraduate classes, have read um, at, least, uh, at least parts of it. Um, and even more recently, I think, there are seats back here if you guys want to sit. Maybe you can just offer them some seats. Um, even more recently, he's the editor of a book that has just, just come out, or maybe it's just a few weeks from coming out, um, published by Manchester University Press on uh, South Africa's historiography since uh, 1994. Um, so thank you very much to Tula for uh, coming to speak to us today and uh, for making the trek up to Mafeking. He drove up this morning from, from Pretoria. Before I hand over to you, Tula, I just want to um, acknowledge the presence of a very um, significant uh, person in the room here with us who is a historical actor, I think, in, uh, who, who, whose history speaks very closely to, the, to uh, what Tula will be speaking about today. And Bernard... Professor Benham Benga, do you want to introduce yes. him? If you could turn, turn on, on your mic, yeah, yeah. Let's see if that works. Um, thank, thank you. you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, good morning, colleagues, and good morning, uh, students. I have brought along one of the outstanding uh, stalwarts of the anti apartheid liberation struggle in South Africa. Um, he's truly a living legend, but uh, you'll know why in just a minute. Um, he's, a, he's a close personal and family friend who originates from Lehorutse, uh, from Binokana, actually, uh, very close to Zirast. His name is Radilari Mumakwa. This is the man. And uh, he joined the MP in his teens in the mid-1960s, can you believe it? And uh, he did his uh, military training uh, in a number of places, including Odessa in the Ukraine, which was then a part of the Soviet uh, Union. Uh, in 1967, he was a member of the Lutuli Combat Detachment, uh, which participated in the Wanki military campaign commanded by the late Chris Honey. So Chris Honey was the commander of this gentleman. And uh, he returned to South Africa in the early 1990s and worked in the Northwest Provincial Government until his retirement um, a short while later. He lives here in Mabato Mafking, and uh, he's still, luckily, very strong. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Great, thank you. Um, so, um, Tula, over to you. Sorry, we are getting some reports that there's a bad echo. So what I'm going to suggest is that... There. So um, can you just put this next to Tula? Okay, it sounds like that might be fine now. Okay, go for it. I'll fiddle around if necessary. So thanks. 
I would like to thank the Northwest University History Department for the invitation and welcome to all of the listeners. The title of this paper refers to Muriel Horrell, Muriel, Muriel Horrell and Kuntu Asizwe's first historian, who since 1949 had been the research officer for the South African Institute of Race Relations. In that capacity, she was tasked with tracking political, social and economic trends in the country. Her, 90, her 1963 booklet, Action, Reaction and Counteraction, considered a new phenomenon, that of the turn to violence by opposition groups in the country. This included MK, whose first operation was launched on 15 December 1961. She interpreted the development in terms of a theme she had tracked in her previous publications, namely how the implementation of apartheid since 1948 had unleashed successive waves of conflict of which the turn to violence was the fifth. In this presentation, I will follow the subsequent developments in the literature, how it has grown in tandem with the questions thrown up by the progress of the liberation struggle and the capacity of available sources to answer those questions. The first works following Horrells drew on the documentary hall that the state obtained in suppressing the ANC's underground during the early 1960s. Among the ensuing prosecutions, the, Revo the Rivonia trial of MK's high command generated the greatest interest. Following sentencing in July 1964, two books had appeared by the end of the following month. The first was by a retired judge, H.H.W. de Villiers, and the second by the journalist Laurit Stradom. They diverged from Horrell by embracing the prosecution's case that the South African Communist Party was responsible for the insurgency through its earlier capture of the African National Congress and its subsequent receipt of external Eastern Bloc support. Other works by Christopher Mack, Blach Robla, and others advanced the same state narrative. With its leadership dispersed between prison and exile, it took a while for the ANC to regroup. Joe Slover, who was Nelson Mandela's deputy on the first MK High Command, had evaded arrest as he was abroad on a mission to canvass the ANC's external leadership on Operation Maibuya, a guerrilla warfare blueprint. In a pair of articles in the late 60s, Slovo noted that MK's founders had drawn inspiration from Che Guevara's depiction of the Cuban Revolution. Slovo, however, used the articles to reconsider certain notions. He criticized Guevara, Regis Debray, and by implication, himself and the other MK founders, for having believed that the mere insertion of a military foco into an area of political conflict might suffice to ignite guerrilla warfare. Slovo's self-critique was then adopted by the ANC when it adopted a strategy and tactics paper drafted by him at its 1969 conference in Morogoro, Tanzania. Slovo's inter intervention showed that only through a comparative historical framework can MK's founding be understood. But the then global prominence of guerrilla revolution, people's war, and wars of national liberation also ensured that the interest was reciprocated. This was particularly so in the United States, which was then quagmired in Vietnam. It was to the Cold War American University that MK's historiography owed its development as an academic subject. The work was less by professional historians than by political scientists looking for general principles about this new form of conflict. Edward Fate, Edward Fate's Urban Revolt in South Africa, a case study, was the first book published by a tenured academic, whilst Alfred Malaya contributed the first doctoral dissertation in 1973. Within a decade, further dissertations by John Nelson, Elena Durabji, Elaine Friedman, and Robert Fatton followed, all while South Africa awaited its first defil. The collapse of Portugal's empire in 1974 followed by the Soweto uprising two years later, put the liberation movement back on the offensive. As the armed struggle revived, Michael Morris and Tom Lodge tracked MK operations incident by incident with the aim of identifying macro level trends. They both identified what Michael Morris called a peak and valley phenomenon in the figures. In other words, there's periods where it's cresting and going down. And Lodge pointed out that operations usually crested around ANC anniversaries. But the two were guided by very different ideological motives. Above all, Lodge refused to accept terror as an explanation of the ANC's motives. Instead, he mined the sources for insight into the external missions, organization, and objectives. 
In this regard, he identified an internal reconstruction department established in 1977 to build clandestine structures in South Africa as being of critical importance to counter the state strategy of armed diplomacy, which aimed to drive the ANC out of the neighborhood before its insurgency had taken root within South Africa's borders. The ANC, however, feared the South African government's anti-terrorist rhetoric gaining traction in the West, which led to an important breakthrough as it invited two Americans, Stephen Davis and Carol Douglas, to become the first journalists to visit MK's camps. The visit informed a 1987 book by Davis titled Apartheid Rebels, which sought to introduce the ANC to the American public. Davis identified the ANC's internal politics as being defined by a schism between its political leadership and military rank and file on the issue of civilian casualties. The issue was a critical one for the movement at the time, for reasons that were illustrated in a 1986 book by Michael Morris and Tian Kumbrink. The publication crunched data on bombings since 1981. The figures indicated that while the proportion of attacks on soft to hard targets was 80% hard, 20% yeah, soft, yeah, yeah, yeah. those figures had almost exactly reversed in 1986. At the same time, the okay, rate of casualties between 1981 yeah. to 1986. Yeah. The mix of softer oh targets and higher okay. casualties indicated a plateauing. Yeah, in once it comes, let me just. 1988 article by Alan Phillips the implications, okay. noting the ANC's but November well, 1987 sorry, statement expressing its willingness no, to participate to, in constitutional talks, to conditional on them being morning, establishing a democracy. Please. He argued that if um, existing we could not do so yesterday evening, but of negotiation course, set young, sentiment always could want be to do things, to and it was my daughter. In 1988, Lodge identified uh, the ANC's key internal dividers being it, between uh, negotiators and um, insurrectionists, while an it, article the following year offered support for Phillips's view of the fluidity of the mean, situation, before you get married, noting that the schism had become one uh, that uh, transcended uh, distinctions uh, of rank and generation. Uh, the scholarship of the 80s now most impressive achievements. Yes, In their so respective we, we ways, Lodge, Morris, Phillips, and Davis adopted methodological and analytical principles that enabled them to identify the major landmarks on the ANC's road to negotiations and date with precision the moments of the key turning the key turning points. F.W. de Klerk's decision to unban the ANC in February 1990 was a historiographical game changer. Firstly, it reduced the need for military secrecy. Days after the speech, the journalist Howard Burrell outed himself as an underground political operative. Burrell had initiated a research project two years previously that led to the publication of a 1990 booklet, MK, the ANC's Armed Struggle, and conscripts to their age, a dissertation completed three years later. Burrell set himself the task of explaining why the ANC had not proved able to mount a more sustained challenge for seizing state power. He adopted Lodge's argument for he too flagged the inability to have built sufficiently resilient underground structures. Importantly, Burrell's critique was in informed by interviews with ANC operatives. Interviews informed another important study published in 1990, Jacqueline Cox, Colonels and Caders, which explored the role of gender on both sides of the insurgency. Her informants stressed the discrepancy between the organization's egalitarian ideology and the often rigid gender roles within its military wing. The changes in the literature were well displayed by two works in 1992. C.J.B. LaRue's massive 600-page thesis at the University of Pretoria was the largest study of MK produced by anybody anywhere until that point. But in a sense, it marked an end rather than a beginning, for it drew for its source material on records that predated the great opening of the early 1990s. In a sense, it contained less about MK's internal workings than Burrell's 77-page booklet two years earlier. Also in 1992, Stephen Ellis and Oyama writing as Tsepoche Seshaba, published Comrades Against Apartheid. It sought to develop a fresh account of M MK's history based on the new material, and this included testimony of escapees from the ANC's camps who had revealed their experiences in detention in camps in Angola. But its noticeable 
notable as a work for its attempt to marshal the testimony for a qualified rehabilitation of the state's old anti-communist line. Specifically, Ellison Sashaba alleged the SACP had established control over the ANC in exile and subsequently abused that power to neutralize non-communist dissidents. The early 1990s also saw the opening of a number of relative archi relevant archival repositories in South Africa. This included the ANC's archives, which were deposited at Forte's university, Forte University. These developments combined with broader political changes in the country ensured that for the foreseeable future, South Africa would be the center of gravity for research on MK. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission was launched in the mid 1990s with the objective of reconciling South Africans around a common understanding of the past. Inevitably, it failed. The report's release was postponed by a day as the ANC sought relief over the report's findings that the liberation movement had perpetrated gross human rights abuses in its military targeting, treatment of prisoners, and glorification of mass violence as a method of people's war. Having failed to introduce the report, in 2000, in the year 2000, President Thabo Mbeki bemoaned the absence of reliable information on the liberation struggle as he initiated the establishment of the South African Democracy Education Trust, which was initially planned to proceed in five volumes covering the 1960 to 1994 period, an exact mirror of the TRC's structure. A number of independent studies had emerged by then based on the new archives. The Maibuya Center at the Western Cape and the ANC archives at Forterre informed many theses, including those by Linda von den Steinem, Marin Seeberg, and Nikki van Driel, and these were all at South African institutions. Vladimir Shubin, a former official of the Soviet Union who had worked closely with the ANC, published a study at the end of the 1990s with the goal of demolishing distortions of the Soviet Union's role in South Africa's liberation. This meant taking on Ellis and Mabandla's comrades, which was then considered the leading work on the topic. Shubin referred to Ellis and Mabandla's plea for their readers' forbearance for not having provided reference for the information. Shubin drew on this and proceeded to deliver one of the most brutal demolition jobs in South African historiography. Besides his personal experience, Shubin complemented research at Forter and the Maibuya Center with work in the Russian state archives. This anticipated another important trend as the early 2000s developed, as international repositories opened their records on the liberation struggle, permitting the writing of a wider transnational war. Among the TRC's critics was Anthea Jeffrey of the South African Institute of Race Relations. From the early 1990s, she had demonstrated in overwhelming detail the untenability of the third force thesis that the surge in political violence during those years was solely attributable to the depredations of Inkata and state operatives on ANC supporters. Her critique on the of the TRC focused on it having overlooked what she claimed was the African National Congress's role, and specifically the significance of a delegation that the movement set to, sent to Vietnam in 1978 to imbibe the principles of people's war. She detailed her alternative theses, thesis in a 2009 book, People's War, it was subtitled New Lights on the Struggle for South Africa, but it was arguably there that the difficulties arose. For example, she deduced the conflict of the briefing, the content of the briefing that the ANC would have received from the work of the American scholar, Douglas Pike. But by 2009, the ANC's archives in Forte made it possible to access Oliver Tambo's handwritten notes of the briefings directly. Similarly, her account of the implementation of the People's War from the mid 1980s through almost entirely on her previous research rather than subsequent secondary writings. This mattered for the notion that the ANC from 1978 relentlessly pursued a people's war strategy taken from the Vietnamese not only contradicted Barrell's research, which pointed to the ANC groping for a successful strategy from the 1980s, but also Padre O'Malley, whose autobiography of, on Mac Maharaj, who was the founding secretary of the Reconstruction Development Department that I mentioned earlier, Tom Lodge, referring to, drew on vast interview material that echoed Burrell's account. This, emerged on, this touched on an emerging difficulty in the literature in creating a meaningful synthesis given the profusion of primary and secondary material that was emerging. Another example was provided by the fourth volume of the Sadat Project, where Jabulani Satole used his chapters to challenge Burrell's arguments about the failure of the armed struggle to create the requisite conditions for people's war 
and O'Malley's contention that this left the movement trailing the masses. He adopted a two-pronged approach. One was pointing to the ANC's repeated reference to its struggle resting on four pillars and offering his trilogy on the Natal underground as evidence of the pillars of armed underground and mass struggle working in tandem. Yet as an attempted rebuttal of Barrel and O'Malley, the, record, the method was only partly successful. The problem was it overlooked the broad evidence that the two had gathered from interviews with leaders of the ANC's operational structures of the frustrations that they felt at the armed struggle's failure to create the requisite conditions for people's war and how they felt this left the movement trading the masses. In 2011, Stephen Ellis returned to the field with a triple motive. One was to collect, to correct the factual errors in comrades um, against a, a, apartheid, but to insist that the overall argument of the Communist Party's domination of the ANC remains sound and to extend this further. Regarding the latter, Percy Utah, the chief prosecutor in the Rivonia trial, had used his foreword to Loritz Stradom's Rivonia Unmasked to claim that Nelson Mandela had been a communist at the time of MK's founding. The issue had long been controversial and comrades had sidestepped it, but in the genesis of the ANC's armed struggle, Ellis not only asserted the allegation's truth, but adopted the extreme version of the claim in asserting that Mandela was acting under the South African Communist Party's discipline at the time that he formed MK. These ideas were incorporated into a 2012 book, External Mission, that covered the whole period of the ANC in, um, in, in exile. His intervention generated wide engagement. Paul Landau adopted what might be called the moderate version, where he agreed that Mandela had joined the party, but Landau rebutted that uh, he claimed that Mandela remained guided throughout by his African nationalist convictions and operated with autonomy from the Communist Party's dictates. Simon Stevens and Garth Bennyworth, meanwhile, delivered multiple articles on aspects on the, of the unfolding of the opening phase of the ANC's armed struggle. Bennyworth was important for fusing material on the state's counterintelligence operations. While the early period dominated, later periods of MK's history got much attention. For example, David Beresford and Joe Ansi van Veek wrote on Operation Mac, which was the ANC's 1982 sabotage operation of the Kuburg nuclear plant while Jacob Lamini's Ascari opened, offered a perspective of apartheid-era turncoats, extending a theme explored in his earlier books, which argued and sought to explore the theme of the entangled lives of black and white South Africans under apartheid. Another book by Lamini, the terrorist art album, drew on the document employed by the South African police to identify fugitives returning to South Africa from abroad. One change with the transition was that previously scholarship had been viewed as an extension of the war, used by pragmatic, of, pragmatic officers such as Joe Slovo to interrogate problems of revolutionary warfare. That link had been lost, but some sought to maintain it. Gabriel R Remuhale and Rocky Williams, for example, in separate articles, pointed to ways that MK's experience could inform the training of the new South African National Defense Force. But Ramuhale questioned the relevance of MK's experience in a context in the 21st century in which so much war was borderless. What I'd like to um, ask, uh, raise as a possible topic as we come to the final stage of the presentation, the extent to which this diffidence might perhaps be unmerited. As we have seen, critics pointed to many factors, such as the absence of a conducive terrain and secure rear bases that counted against waging successful conventional guerrilla warfare premised on the existence of secure sanctuaries. In other words, this is an argument people made about why MK's struggle would be different. Is it not in terms, therefore, that it's precisely in terms of how to wage a borderless armed struggle that MK's experience is important, making it more relevant in the 21st century than many other of these classical revolutionary struggles. The difficulty in taking root meant ANC needed to be much more creative and improvisational with popular mobilization. Culture played, a, culture played a much greater part than in any other Southern African liberation struggle. A series of articles in the early, in the 2010s, in other words, the decade leading to now, considered aspects of this. For example, Jocelyn Alexander and Joanne McGregor considered how the mk Zapu alliance led to the migration of the Toy Toy from Algerian camps to South African townships. Another book, Liberation um, Radio by Sakibo Lehwati and Tepo Muloy, amongst others, 
considered virtual means that transcended um, logistical difficulties, for example, the use of radio, radio freedom, to mobilize people, to get over these obstacles. Other works included the work on Tami Mainele and the Medu Art Ensemble based in Khabarone about the artistic dimension of the ANC's armed propaganda. In other words, using the creative arts as a means of supplementing military strategy. Other theses produced in the 2010s were about the role of songs in the camps, but also in terms of transmitting that aspect of um, popular culture. In other words, the difficulties of waging a classical guerrilla war, guerrilla war led South, um, the South African um, revolutionaries to become much more innovative and much more creative in terms of popular mobilization. What we've discussed, and this is a, 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 a brief summary of a, uh, what is at the moment a too detailed paper, and these are some of the sparring partners that have accompanied me in my contributions to the field. The start, as far as I was concerned, was reading Burrell's um, MK, The ANC's Armed Struggle. And right at the end, he has this vignette about, the book is written in 1990, and he speaks about how if the negotiations succeed. The uh, Mkuntu Asidu will have gone, succeeded by seeking to avoid war, but going to war. And he left that as a paradox. Many other articles subsequently focused on this. For example, I spoke of Edward Fates earlier. Him and another American um, scholar, uh, Richard Gibson, who are reared with the US black power movement as their context, responded with bafflement to MK's assertions in this regard. For example, another one was um, Nelson Mandela's statement at the dock, where he expressed his, his reluctance to wage a civil war in the South African context. In a different way, in the 1980s, Davis referred to this uh, diffidence, and Daniel Duick had more recently referred to it. My thesis explored the extent to which this could be used as an overarching theme to understand MK's history. But overarching themes are only worth so much. At the same time, while it provides a specific theme, it's as an aspect of a much larger whole. In other words, there are many themes which make up the Mkwantuasi's most complex history. My postdoctoral work was developed, devoted to exploring other features, such as the relationship between the armed and mass struggles, the ANC's history in different places of exile, such as Swaziland and Zambia. My book on Mkwantuasi's were offered an overall account. The title of the book, MK, Umkontuasis with the ANC's Armed Struggle, was a deliberate salute to Burrell and his role in um, stimulating my thought in this regard. But in terms of how we classify and understand the whole and how it developed, I would suggest the following as a possibility. Of much important work has been done, but arguably there's one theme of decisive importance that has not yet been factored in as a explanation of how the struggle unfolded. And that is the factor of dis a distance. And I want to qualify what I mean that by that. Many have pointed out how logistical barriers blunted the ANC's attacks. But what I want to suggest or raise as a possible discussion point is the extent to which it also impacted the state and limited its counterattacks against the ANC. For example, the ability to retreat into the vastness of post-colonial Africa enabled the ANC to not only absorb the blow of the Rivonia raid, but also to absorb future blows. Placing all of its eggs into the South African basket would have created a dilemma for the um, organization. The reward would be higher in terms of increasing the regularity and intensity of attacks. This is what people like Lodge and Burrell are referring to when they speak about the need to have built internal structures. But there would also be numerous risks. Above all, there would be the risk of suffering the kind of destruction that the ANC narrowly avoided in the early 60s. And when we, we, you look at the histories of the ANC in the late 1960s, there's a very long recovery process. It was a difficult enough process. What I'm proposing here is no posthumous reconstruction, but a statement on the different streams of thought that were represented in the ANC's internal debates. In other words, there was a choice to survive and have um, a low intensity but protracted struggle. And that is the significance. Because this decision and this rationale informed the reality that South Africa had a protracted low intensity conflict of armies facing each other at such difference that at times it was difficult, if not impossible, for them to inflict blows on each other at all. This also included and helped us, helps us to explain, in my opinion, how the macro level strategic aspects developed. This included fits, starts, cul de sacs promising beginnings that led to nowhere, but also apparently abortive missions that suddenly, after many years sometimes, res resurrected into signs of life. And this also shaped the experience because many in the post-apartheid literature have sought to recapture the experience of MK's cadres. 
Staying true to this vision, I believe, involves abandoning the search for clean cut binaries, straight edge teleologies, and above all, the brutal simplification of complex identities. It was this picture that I tried to portray in my book on Mkonto Asizwe. And whilst all verdicts are provisional in a field as dynamic such as this, it is the um, picture of the past that still, to me to this day, seems to be the most persuasive representation. Thank you very much. Um, great, thank you very much um, to uh, Professor Simpson for that fascinating presentation. Um, so we're going to take questions now. We are using my laptop as a mic, so we'll just have to pass it around if you want to ask a question. I'm looking for questions online um, and in the room. Um, we've got one hand here, if I can take two. Let's take two um, and then we'll, and then and, and the third, then we'll take that as a round. You can just pass this down. Uh, you can go first. Yeah. Uh, okay. Is it okay if I have two questions? Okay. <laughs> um, I, that was a, I mean, it's a tour de force. Um, I was wondering if you could put, firstly, if you could put the broad spectrum of uh, stereographical reference that you were, you were making. Um, into a sort of timeline of uh, the historical context in which each of those things was being produced. Um, so it starts with people sort of trying to, you, you mentioned, people sort of trying to explore, you know, what was this MK, what was the intention? And it ends more or less in the 2010s, 2020s, with people trying to explore questions about Askaris and Mpimpis and Salat, et cetera. Um, and that those seem like they're important sort of moments in history in which people are trying to explore these different ideas. So I wonder if you could go through it a little bit like that, just to, in particular for the students, to get an idea of what the what the context we're talking about is. Um, and the second one was that I noticed that you you didn't mention uh, Comrade Mzala um, Malo, who wrote about cooking the rice in the pot. You, you mentioned some of the historiography dealing with internal uh, debates within the ANC about the role of, of, of MK and, and, and uh, the this, this sort of grand strategy that it should take, take on. Um, so I thought that it might be interesting to, to go into some of that a bit more in detail. So for example, this um, Mzala is a famous example, I guess, of internal conflict over what should be done. Uh, thank you very much, Prof, for that uh, captivating presentation. It was as if I was watching uh, the history of MK on a history channel. It was very captivating. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, I have two questions. Uh, the first one is that uh, what was the role that uh, the South African Communist Party played in the establishment of uh, the ANC's military wing known as um, Kondo, the Kondo Esizwe? The second one is that... Uh, what are the actual functionalities of uh, the Mkondo Wesiswe military wing in today's ANC? Because uh, the last time we heard about MK was when uh, Carl Nielsen uh, was still part of that ANC. Uh, today we have not heard anything about uh, that particular military wing. Thank you. Yeah, good. Um, thank you, thank you, Prof, for a um, very lucid kind of um, presentation. Um, I've heard you mention, I think, twice or so, um, references um, to oral interviews. I wonder to what extent uh, you have used historiography that is based on oral interviews, um, such as the, the, the very extensive work of uh, Ariana Lissoni, for instance. Uh, I'm sure you know of her, of her uh, and her work, um, and my own work with uh, Andy Manson and Ariana Lissoni as well. Um, in a book called um, 
a history of the ANC in the Northwest province from 1909 to 2012, which came out um, about four years ago. Um, yeah, so how much does historiography based on oral interviews, um, how much does it feature in your work? Thanks. Well, they studied volumes as well. I mean, it's, it's practically all of it is, is on, based on oral interviews. Thank you. Thank you. Now, in terms of the out um, abstract, I did promise to speak about action, counter reaction, and reaction. And um, I'm, the first question asked me to put my money where my mouth is and come up with the broad phases as far as that is concerned. The first phase was a attempt based on South African reactionaries, basically, when the liberation struggle was down, to bury it and to dismiss it as being a communist-based conspiracy. The advantage which they had was proximity to the sources, because when the state captured the high command, it also captured the best part of their archive. So to this very day, people still use Operation Maibuya, Nelson Mandela's Diary of His Tour of Africa. These are classic documents. And they had the first access to it. That was the first archive. And that archive was mined to try and claim that this was a communist conspiracy. And I've spoken about Percy Utah doing that. But then the second phase was the um, attempt of the ANC and people like Slovo to fight back. There's an interesting phase where it was globalized. In other words, it became an international research topic. American Research Foundation funding fueled a whole series of projects. Um, I've touched on the... Um, Tips of it, other aspects of it is the protest to challenge Karras and Gerhardt, I'm sure all, all aware of it. This is a Stanford University Hoover Institution to bring the archive together, a very important reclamation project. In the 1980s, as the struggle intensified, you had pro-apartheid scholars like Lodge and Morris working on the same sources, um, but coming up with very different interpretations. Post-1990 first wave of freedom, there was um, an increasingly attempt to glorify the heroes and heroines of the liberation struggle um, and a sort of rote liberation teleog teleological approach. And what I touched on in the last phase where people are beginning to focus into complexities, hidden histories, entanglements, the messier, murkier story is all to do with the trajectory of the country post polyquani conference where people are asking new questions of the past and seeking to reinterrogate. In a very broad brushed way, those are, those are the broad phases that I would discern in terms of shaping the intellectual history. In terms of Comrade Mzala, a very interesting and based on the trends which I've identified, a thesis which is going to come, uh, nobody's done it yet, but it's inevitably going to come, is looking at the role of ANC publications. Because if you look at ANC publications like Dawn, they were, and like Radio Freedom, the ANC speaking to the masses in South Africa. In other words, if you write an article in Dawn, it's no more for internal discussion than a Radio Freedom broadcast. The idea is this publication is going to come to South Africa and it's going to be distributed where people will get tips on how to wage guerrilla warfare. They'll receive the ANC's ideological line and this will fuel a people's war. These aspects of popular culture are all part of the same. So I've spoken about how people are focusing on these different aspects of people's war, the role of culture, and that's a thesis which somebody's inevitably going to do, and that's going to be a continuation of trends. So I would differentiate between Mzala's publications in those forums, such as African Communist and Dawn, which are very much meant for public consumption, and the debates which the ANC is having internally, and that will get me to the oral history, and I'm going to speak about that, and because it's an extension of the archives. What role did South African Communist Party play in the founding? It's a topic of live controversy where people have different opinions at the moment. Um, Paul Landau, who's a very great authority on this, he's written a book called Spear, which came out a couple of years ago. He echoes, as I touched on in the presentation, the idea that Nelson Mandela was a member of the party, but he disagrees with Ellis's argument that he was working as a Communist Party operative under centralized control. 
Mandela always claimed that he never actually went through the technicality of joining the Communist Party, because there's certain things which are not debatable. Firstly, that he worked very closely with communists like Joe Slovin founding the military wing, that they were so closely together that they could almost be members of the same party. But he always was publicly clear that he never actually joined the South African Communist Party. And if you look at all of the information and sources, nobody's been able to find the definitive proof that he joined the party. I think the likeliest story is that he was working so close that it didn't make a practical difference because they were one in the same, same underground structures, places like Lillisley Farm in Rivonia. But if you ask whether he ever actually took an oath, swore in a document, signed a membership form, that I don't believe, well, nobody's found the proof of that. So at the moment, at the very least, it's unproven. Um, and I, it, there's every chance that that was never actually physically um, taken as a step. Um, what are the functionalities? I've, as far as the MK Veterans Association and post-1990 developments of MK as a post-liberation army, I've tried to keep that um, out of the scope of the story for no other reasons than that the actual article on which this is based is already um, 10, 10, 10 and a half thousand uh, words. It needs to come down to 8,000. And I'm looking to cut down themes rather than add to them. That's an important, but what I'm focusing on is published works and how that is fed into the struggle and the memory of the struggle. So I'm going to cop out and say not my not quite my topic. In terms of oral interviews, that has been an accompaniment of most projects. If you look at most books, just take an innocuous example. It's one of many, many examples, which is on my mind at the moment. Nadia Mangesi's Maputo Connection. She was married to an ANC member. She drew on her personal experience, but she also conducted interviews. Another interesting one is Elias Masileli, uh, Masile Masilela, sorry, 43 Trelawney Park, family memory, but also drawing on interviews. So something that's been done very often is research projects but supplementing it with oral history. When we speak of the Karras and Gerhardt project, that was a project to re reclaim the history of the liberation struggle from people's basements and attics because you know it was underground movement and that is why the protest challenge series developed. I hope that a project of a similar scale uh, will develop because the post-1990 material has been stimulated by inter alia the TRC archive, that's an oral history collection where people were interviewed, it's now online, that has informed many projects. Uh, Howard Burrell's papers, he deposited them in Oxford, that has um, informed many papers. Um, the Karis Gerhardt project has been um, stored at Bits University, but there's all sorts of different book projects which have developed their own oral history archives. And a similar project of reclamation which can store and save those memories into one archive, a project of the scale and scope and ambition of the Karis Gerhardt project to reclaim, restore, and save for posterity all of these individual research projects, because it's almost been as if everybody who wants to write on MK has felt the need to go to the archives, but also to conduct their own interviews, but only some of these have informed the broader literature. Those which have been archived have had a huge stimulus and there's a lot more that can be done. So hopefully that's an archival project that can be developed subsequently. Great, thanks. Um, I see, uh, Professor Chunga, do you want to unmute and ask your question? Otherwise, I can read it out. And I've got a question and then also looking for other hands, um, Robert. And okay. Um, let me see if I can unmute you. Uh, I can't. Can you try and mute? Clarence, Ch Clarence Chunga? There we go. Go for it. Yeah. I have a problem with my mic. Could you just oh. read my question to Professor? Yeah, Thank sure. You. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Please. Okay. Thank you. So, so the question from um, Clarence Chango at um, UNSA in Zambia. Uh, this is a fascinating presentation of the historiography of the ANCs in Kunduwe Sizwe. Two questions. What are the problems or lacuna at the moment, if any? Um, are there any that have been identified in the historical writings about the MK? That's the first. 
Uh, and the second is, what is the current state of the literature regarding the MK? Maybe you want to say more about, about that. Um, and then I have a question. I see uh, one of the participants online is struggling to hear. If others are also struggling to hear, please let us know. If it, Maybe it's just, just them. Um, but my, my question um, is about to what degree, I know this doesn't fit directly in with uh, the, uh, the paper that you are, are, um, have written, but to what degree um, has the trajectory of the historiography on the MK, to what degree is it similar to the trajectory of um, other um, uh, military wings of other liberation organizations? Have they uh, been subject to the same kind of interrogation and sh uh, changes and shifts in their interrogation? Or does the MK uh, hold such a particular position in, in South Africa's history that um, it's it has to be treated um, on its own terms? And then Robert, if you want to ask your question, if we can just ask you to come a bit closer to this mic over here. I'm sure they'll be able to hear Yeah, um, sorry, thank you, Tula. That was really interesting. Um, this uh, question is not, uh, directed at you, but we have a, a large uh, a cohort of uh, 312 students, environmental history students here in the class. Um, and uh, I'm sure their they, they intentions aren't, aren't pure in the sense <laughs> that there was an incentive for them to be here. Uh, but nonetheless, they, they had a wonderful example of what a, a brilliant historian can do and, and present and so forth. Um, but anyway, many of Tula mentioned many of the, the themes, uh, or, or many of the authors that we actually cover in environmental history, including Joanne McGregor and Jacob Lamini. And um, so this question is uh, posed to the students, not at Tula. Um, how do these themes that we cover in three, two, one collide, correspond, and assimilate okay, with the histori historiography presented by Tula? Okay. Um, uh, uh, and in particular, uh, how this links us to, to, to possible African uh, epistemologies of uh, ind indigeneity. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, and feel free to also comment on that if you want to, like extra marks for your 312 class. <laughs> okay, so can you just switch? No, but at the moment, there are considerable um, problems and lacunae which are being explored by people. I mean, there's been a heavy concentration on the turn to arms struggle and the role of Nelson Mandela. This has led to a relative under exploration and under examination of certain other themes which could be explored um, in greater detail about ANC's presence in different countries. I mean, at the moment, there are very interesting sounding dissertations about MK's role in Egypt. Um, another one on the East German connection, um, and also new conceptualizations can also be developed about explaining the overall development of the struggle. So it's a bit, how long is a piece of string? I mean, there's a whole series of projects which could be developed um, in the future. With regards to what the current um, state of the literature is, I think it's rich and I think it's progressive. And I think that a challenge, um, however, is the fact that it's moving in so many specialized directives. One of the incentives and reasons and hopeful positive points about developing a work on the historiography is maintaining some sort of unity and understanding of how much has been done. For example, a lot of people, I read an article recently claiming that the first work to focus on the turn to arm struggle was the protest to chal challenge in 1977, but there've been works produced by it almost from the um, Rivonia raid in 1963 and there's a huge literature predating that so there's um one of the problems we have is not enough understanding of the whole vastness of the development of the historiography and i think that integrating that intellectual development would be useful making sure that we're not going over um territory which has been done before uh, to what degree has the trajectory been similar to other military organization i'd need to get much deeper into the um, historiographies of other liberation struggles to identify similar trends uh, my focus is uh, much more on um, the South African one than any other comparable um, in, uh, liberation struggle in the region. Apart from cliches such as there was a period in which um, all of the liberation struggles were st struggling in the early 1960s. 
and there was a tendency to view Southern Africa as a single frame. So people were integrating what's happening in Portugal, uh, Portuguese, Portugal's empire, Rhodesia and South Africa and developing cross-cutting narratives. And that in all of these countries, there was, I would imagine, a post-liberation um, celebration of the achievement of freedom and then the emergence of more complex, diverse centrifugal histories afterwards. But that would need to be verified by a larger project than I am currently doing. With regards to environmental history, it's very significant and relevant to the actual historiography, because when we speak about natural bases and terrain, that literally is speaking about the role of the environment and the insurgency. And one of the most interesting articles um, produced in the last 10 years or so was by two um, academics at the University of um, Zimbabwe, which quantified the difficulties that MK and Zipra faced the, re the odds are really against them. There's no water, there's lots of game reserves, you have to fight through them. Um, there is um, arid populations, empty populations because you're getting into the desertif desertified territory there. So there's huge odds against the idea of a successful insurgency operating through that area where MK was trying to do um, infiltrate in the 1960s. So I would say that Actually, environment and um, military history is absolutely central, and no understanding of this particular topic is important without it. So I'm not sure about the scope of your project, but certainly there's a, a role about the role of environment in war, um, uh, and there's a very extensive literature about how that shaped the insurgency, limited it, made it possible in different ways. Um. I see Ariana's got a question online, Majuta's got a question. Anyone else want to add? Okay, let's go. With Ariana, can you unmute? Hi. Uh, Sorry. Can you hear me? Oh, oh. thanks. Sorry, try again, Ariana. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, hi. Thanks, Tula, for the overview. Um, my question uh, is uh, is really about, I just wanted to hear your thoughts on the importance of the SADC project and the Road to Democracy project, um, and the, uh, which obviously included a big oral history component. Uh, and it was through that project that veterans like Ntate Momakwa um, who's there with us um, uh, have been interviewed and, and um, uh, it's, it's sort of a, their voice is brought out in the uh, Road to Democracy volumes, um, especially, you know, in terms of what you were saying earlier as uh, a, 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 about the responses to the thesis by Stephen Ellis about the communist conspiracy and control of the VANC and the armed struggle. And well, while I'm here, I'm just curious, another book you haven't mentioned, um, I'm just curious to hear uh, your thoughts about uh, Paul Landau's The Spear. Great, thank you.
Colleagues, we can't hear. The, uh, since the question had been asked, there has been no sound. Not sure if it's muted on the laptop. Can you hear now? Okay, great. Sorry. Sorry, can we start again? From SADC project, very important series of volumes, very extensive, introduced a lot of important original material not been accessed before. But in addition to that, beyond the published material, there's a huge archive. Some of it has appeared in the Hashim and Beta project, um, which is a one which seeks to integrate struggles throughout Southern Africa. But that's only a fraction of their oral history archive. Snippets of the oral history archive have informed another a number of important um, dissertations and topics, and to the extent to which all of that archive is uh, um, opened, it will become a resource for many years to come. Paul Landau's Spear, very important book, most comprehensive study of the opening phase of the armed struggle. What's also very interesting and important and should not be forgotten about it is that it doesn't just include MK, it also includes Poco and the um, African resistance movement, and it's comprehensive about all of the revolutionaries in the underground, and it's now the leading work on that topic, no question about that, and it is a very competitive field because a lot of people have been writing about it, so it's an important and significant achievement, of which, because it's been released so recently, we're only just absorbing the significance and importance, and that will grow. Now, with regards to center points for MK's history, one of the most interesting things is people trying to develop new center points. For example, I spoke about 43 Trelawney Park, and what Elias Macedela is saying is that that is a property which is as important in its own way as Lilisley Farm, because Mozambique via Swaziland was the major infiltration route, and so many of the most famous ANC operations are conceptualized, discussed in this house in Swaziland, which if you go to Swaziland, it's, now not, it, it's not being commemorated to the extent to which it should. There's a huge scope for heritage projects, by the way. When we speak of the Sadat Oral History Archive, a very um, interesting thesis at U University of Cape Town was on um, Northern Transvaal, and it highlights the importance of the University of Limpopo and the students who were there. That's another one. Um, there's been a mention about Ziras, the book Congolose, and the role of um, how the um, Peasants' Revolt fed into the underground in the early 1960s. That's an important transition as well. Important studies of the Eastern Cape. And when I speak about the new archives opening in different countries in Zambia, when those archives opened up, the importance of the Simons' house in uh, Hugh McMillan, um, his work about that 250 Lusaka Road. I may have got the house number wrong, but that all of these different properties throughout Southern Africa. And there's scope for a really interesting heritage as opposed to historical projects. So people are speaking about the future and, you know, there's an ocean of topics that can be developed, but one of them is a heritage project, which is that pre preservation of that history. And I think that the literature on the Bundestag basically extends that because many of these regions, they are, for example, in the Northern, you know, the Northern Transvaal, for example, and in the Northwest there, it's linked to, histories of the Bundestans and the opportunities and obstacles which MK faced um, in operating through those areas. There'd be a scope for one in Swaziland because one of the projects, one of the objectives of the apartheid ideologues is basically selling off parts of the country with the idea that South African Swazis would unite with Swaziland. So there's lots of cross-border opportunities, but also huge obstacles as well. And people have been exploring that. It's an it's an extension of many of these regional studies. Um, do you want to say anything? You don't want to say anything. Okay. Um, we've just gone two o'clock, so we do need to start wrapping up, but I'm looking to see if there are any final hands, any last questions that anyone wants to wants to ask um, to Prof Simpson. One hand there, two hands there, and you will get the last word. So I'll just pass the laptop down there. Um, thank you, Prof. Um, I wanted to ask you, what were the implementations of um, the way where Joslovo criticized himself or the the arm struggle, uh, or which the ANC took um, to even 
criticize themselves. Or even, can you even um, provide the articles on that? Uh, thank you so much for, for the overview of the publication we are about to or already published. My question is, um, I want to know the relevance or the relevance, sorry, of Mkondo Esiso Histography on the current scholarship. Uh, okay, we're going to squeeze in one last hand down there. Sorry. Okay, thank you so much. So, uh, my question um, was Mkhonto a politically aligned movement, or was it, or was it a movement uh, that was only dwelling on the injustice of the laws and regulations? It was implemented by the apartheid government. Sorry. It has gone to a clock. It's load shedding. Um, I'm hoping that uh, those online can hear us. We've just been load shed. Um, and you probably heard the three questions, and Tula hasn't yet started answering. So we're going to ask Tula to answer in the dark. I hope I'm not going to trip over anyone to give it to you here. But bear with us, the lights should come on in a minute or two. Uh, with regards to Slovo's critique, the well, well, I know one of the articles is called Chain Bolivia. The other one is the ideas or theories of Register Bray. They're actually online available from the African communists. So you just put in a smart search word uh, Slovo, Debray, Guevara, and you should be able to get them accessible as PDFs, but those have actually now been online from the journals. Um, now, the other one is relevance on current scholarship. I think this is an important area which needs to be developed in the future. I mean, there's so many potential themes that can be developed. I mean, I spoke about the heritage one as being a potential one, but where does the history of the liberation struggle fall into the broader history of South Africa? There's been an idea to develop it as a sort of discrete subject. And what I mean by that is that the idea that there is um, the history of South Africa, which you learn from your textbooks, which has got apartheid and all of those major categories, but the extent to how the ANC's rise to power, how it feeds into the exile experience, that hasn't been done and that hasn't been integrated well enough. It's sort of like we can exist with two different histories existing in separate realms and they need to be integrated. One of the things I wanted to do successfully or unsuccessfully, but at least it's a start in my history of South Africa is to begin to do that and speaking about how those different um, disciplines, almost historical disciplines, two aspects of South African history can be integrated into each other and can help explain each other because you can't explain post-apartheid South Africa very well, unless you can relate it to the legacy of the liberation struggle for obvious reasons, because it's the ANC and that's how the leading figures in the ANC rose to power. It's where they developed their ideas and it's the implementation of the ideas of the liberation struggle. Um, was MK a politically aligned organization? It was for a moment autonomous from the ANC. It is now politically, well, it, it would then became the ANC's military wing for technicalities, which would bog us down too much to go into now. But I think that the important part of it, and I think that this is something that we need to, or at least I think that it's going to be the most, one of the most fertile directions in the future is getting away from getting bogged down on the ways in which MK was unlike ZAPU and focusing, uh, sorry, unlike ZANU or Frelimo and focusing on that, it was a different struggle with different um, conditions. 
Um, it took much longer to get access to South Africa's borders because it's the most southernmost country. And even when that occurred, the strength of the South African state meant you could not have security in neighboring sanctuaries. You needed to focus on meshing military operations with other forms of popular mobilization. And there's a different balance which is involved there. So this is a long-winded way of saying that I think one of the most interesting features is the extent to which ANC MK was a politicizing army. And if we look at all of the operations from its radio operations, its publications, which was supposed to be disseminated into the country, the role of song, the role of dance, the role of popular culture as part of armed propaganda, I think that that is an area which is beginning to be explored. But my reading of the um, armed struggle leads me to suggest that much richer perspectives can be found in the future, and that will be a very rich vein of future exploration. Great. So I think at that point, we're going to end the seminar. Um, and a huge thank you very much to Professor Tula Simpson for your time, for your generous engagement with our questions for sitting through the dark in the last few minutes of the seminar. Um, I just wanted to say to everybody in the room and those online, there is a final seminar that we're holding in the series. Um, I think it is the last Wednesday of uh, May, which is the 30th or sorry, the last, yeah, the last Wednesday of May, which is the 30th or the 31st of May. Um, Sine Kleinhans is talking about propaganda in World War II. Um, it'll be online and in Potchefstroom for anyone who's who's there. Um, and all that leaves then is a final thank you and a congratulations to Professor Simpson for that fascinating presentation. Thank you. Great. Before people leave, um, I just want to ask my three one two students who need to sign in. <laughs> and then, um, Laura, do you want to present this? Oh, uh, gosh, I can. Do you want to do it in the dark? We can take a picture outside. Okay. Well, just a thank you from the spot. Yeah. Um, just to say that uh, Professor Simpson has come all the way from Gauteng. He took him four hours this morning, given up of his time and spending the night here. So we just want to say thank you very much for your time and your um, engagement. So thank you. Thank you, everybody, for it. Okay. 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 Okay.